really different? Didn't Jesus still descend from the Mount of Olives through the Eastern Gate and into the city on the foal of a donkey? Can't we still celebrate the fact, even if it is in our homes, that they cast coats and palm branches on the streets, something that was done to mark the root of a king, waving the palm branches and singing songs of triumph as they anticipated what Jesus would do? Can't we see the whole event, all the emotion, and wonder how they responded to everything that happened that day? We can, but it's still different. In that day, his coming included the expectation of the people that he would deliver them from the rule and the cruel reign of the Romans among them. They believed that his messianic reign would be one of militaristic conquest with might and power establishing a new, com uh, a new kingdom. Yet when has a king ever come to the battle on the foal of a donkey? When has the army of a king ever been made up of fishermen and tax collectors and commoners like those who follow Jesus? When would a king enter a place of worship and overturn the tables of the money changers and drive them all from their places of business and declare that they had perverted the purpose of that sacred place? When would a king come and then go back to a place of quiet and solitude to worship? Don't kings come to do battle, to conquer foes, to put an end to the tyranny of enemies and drive them from the land. And yet everything that Jesus did was different. It wasn't at all what the people were expecting. So it is today. Today we would never have been, or better, never have been expecting to, to have to stay in our homes away from people, many away from work with schools closed and many of the businesses in the community shut down. We never would have expected that a virus would grind the world to a screeching halt and bring people to their knees praying for safety and protection and healing. But isn't that really what the people were doing in Jesus' day? The Roman rule had changed the hands of a cruel taskmaster upon them. The religious elite had made the teaching of the law so legalistic and restrictive that people were barely free to come to the Lord. The people who followed Jesus were not, were, were, were not yet living in fear, but they were recognizing that something was on the horizon. There wasn't really truly outright aggression yet, but it would not be long. And these people would be fearing for their lives. It wasn't all parades and spectacle and wonder. Oh, there was that, but no one really knew what lay ahead. And there certainly was a little, if no understanding, that this journey to Jerusalem would ultimately lead to a cross. Nevertheless, they celebrated and we do too, and, and don't lose sight of the fact that nothing can separate you from God's love and nothing can take away from us the hope and the faith and the promise and the life that we have in him. It's Palm Sunday. It was a different day back then. It's still a different day. And this morning as we come to the Lord, I want to invite you to turn with me to his word and we're going to take a look at some incredible verses that begin in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9 at uh, verse 29. We're going to read down through verse 41. And I want you to hear this morning the story of what happened as Jesus came into the holy city. Uh, Luke chapter 19 beginning at verse 29 it says, And it came about when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you in which as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Thus shall you speak, the Lord has need of it. There were those who were sent away and found it just as he said. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their garments on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their garments in the road. And as he now was approaching near the descent of the Mount of the Olives, uh, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise joyfully, singing with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached, he saw the city and he wept over it. What an incredible story this morning. A story of the coming of the Christ into the holy city at the start of what would be an incredible week of celebration. Historians tell us that some two and a half million pilgrims were probably there in the city. There was expectation. There was revelry. There was fun. But there was also a sense of something happening in the air. And as Jesus descended the Mount of Olives, he came to a place where he stopped and he looked and he listened and he wept because the people who were there really didn't understand. This morning I want to share with you four words to help us to see the significance of this day, not only in the time of Jesus, but in our day as well. Here are the words I want you to follow. First the colt, then the crowd, then the criticism, and then the cries. Let's take a look at each one of them. Luke chapter 19 verses 30 and 34 describe for us the story of the colt that Jesus rode into the city on. He told his disciples to go into the village opposite you in which as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Thus shall you speak, the Lord has need of it. And those who were sent away found it just as he had said. And as they untied the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying it? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Now, now folks, this is really kind of an interesting part of the story, this colt that they're sent to retrieve. It's quite a thing to be asked to do. In our day, we'd call it theft by proxy. Take a colt that doesn't belong to you, and when you're challenged about the theft that you're committing, just tell them the Lord has need of it. Sure, I'll get right to that, Jesus. I'm pretty confident that I can pull this off, even though the law says that if I steal somebody's colt, I can be put to death. Can you imagine what the owners must have thought? Or why they responded the way that they did? Could it be that they had had an encounter with Jesus and this simple call to borrow a colt was something that was the least they could do for the love that he had shared? But for all of that, I think there was also a lot of confusion happening in the land. 
there was this belief that Jesus was Messiah and Messiah represented a leader who was all powerful and, and all strong and, and he would be able to come in and he would be able to take captive all of the things that needed to be taken captive of and deliver them from all of the things that bound them. But why would he ride in on the foal of a donkey and not a great stallion and war horse? If Jesus was Messiah... Wouldn't that be more appropriate? But they'd missed his message. They really didn't understand. The cult shares with us an incredible set of truths and understandings that we have to come to terms with. You see, first of all, uh, a donkey and a colt represent the gift of peace. It's, it's something that brings a sense of settledness to the world because you have one who can bear your burdens. It also represents servanthood. Because the one thing that the colt did over and over and over and over again was serve as a, a servant, a beast, of burden. And I've been rescued this morning. <laughs> Excuse me just a moment. The blood sugar's really low. <clears throat> and now Greg's offering me a donut. A birthday donut. Wouldn't that be fun? The call is not one when Jesus comes in on a colt to conquer men, but rather to conquer dominions, principalities and powers with a might and a power that can only come from the Lord. The change that was sought would not require majestic warriors, but rather servants who cared for and spoke love and grace and life into the hearts of broken people. The cult tells us that we are to be servants first and most of all, which is exactly what God needs us to be in this day. Givers of peace, helpers to the brokenhearted. You see, the reality is we're hope brokers. People who share hope and encouragement through phone calls and texts and emails and letters when there's no contact that can be had in the community. Jesus came and symbolically shares with us a story of giving peace and help to people who need it the most. But we also notice in this story the crowd. In verse 36, it said, as he was going, they were spreading their garments in the road. And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples, the crowd, began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all of the miracles which they had seen, saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I love this part of the story. It was a praise fest. People actually took time to celebrate and to rejoice and to worship the Lord in glory and in grandeur and to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They threw their coats on the road, something you only do for a king. Second Kings uh, chapter 9, verses 12 and 13 says, thus says the Lord, I've anointed you, Jehu, king over Israel. And it says, they hurried and each man took his garment and placed it on him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet saying, Yehu is king. They were joyful. They celebrated loudly for all the miracles they had seen. That's something we have to get a hold of, folks. They had witnessed something. Palm Sunday is a day when we celebrate Jesus is king. We celebrate the fact that he has done amazing things among us. 
He's transformed our lives. He's forgiven our sins. He saved us from eternal damnation. He's given us hope. And as the crowd begins to exclaim this grand truth, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they understood that with God, all things are possible. They'd seen the miracles. And now they were believing in a positive future. We need to hear that today. Just as in the day of Jesus, the the Roman rule had produced a a spirit of negativity and, and, and bondage on the hearts of the people, so we're living in a time when a virus has produced in the world fear and brought us to our knees praying for protection and health. Can I say something there? I don't think God wants us to live our lives in fear of the possibility of catching a virus that could make us incredibly sick and even cost us our lives. I think he wants us to respect it and do everything that we possibly can do to avoid exposure to it. But having done all, we must refuse to let it control us or rule over us or take our joy from us because we have seen the Lord do so much and we're safe in his hands. Now that doesn't mean that if you're a Christian today, you're not going to catch it. Doesn't mean that today if you're a Christian, you might not possibly lose your life to it. But it does mean today that in Christ we have promise and peace and assurance and the certainty that it is well with our souls. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. We don't have to fear. This crowd wasn't really certain what was coming to them in the days ahead. They weren't really certain what would happen to their Jesus, but they knew this. They'd seen miracles upon miracles upon miracles. And they believed that in Christ there was hope and help and joy. Which brings us this morning to the criticism. Luke chapter 19, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees and the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What a word. Those were unprecedented days. For three and a half years, Jesus had turned the religious establishment on its ear. He had spoken truth like they'd never heard it. He had touched lives in ways that no one else could touch them. He'd healed the sick, given sight to the blind, raised the dead, made the dumb speak, made the deaf hear. He'd cleansed the leper. He'd driven out the demons. He'd done everything to bring the hope and life of a new day to a people. But everywhere he went, and every time he worked another miracle, there was criticism. Somebody always had to find something wrong with what was happening. You know, this isn't a normal Palm Sunday. I'd love to have the sanctuary filled with our people. I'd do anything for a hug from Miss Shirley Turner. I'd love to be able to greet each one of you, shake your hands, give you a hug, spend moments with you in his presence. But I can't. And we can choose to succumb to a spirit of negativity and become critical about all that's happening and saying, I just don't want to worship this way. Or we can say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
These are unprecedented days for the church. We have in front of us one of the greatest opportunities to impact our world with the message of Christ that's probably ever been known historically since the first century. When 9-11 happened back in 2001, America looked to the church for hope, but they didn't find it. Because within about five or six weeks after the event, the church had gone back to business as normal. And the hope and the help that people were seeking, they, they, they didn't find in us. And the world became increasingly critical. We must avoid that at all costs. Today, there are men and women and boys and girls who are asking questions that only the church can answer because the answer is found only in Jesus. And yet everywhere we look, people are still critical. I find it funny that yesterday I read an article that said between blaming the president and blaming Hobby Lobby, if we just could eliminate those two, the problem would have been over. Critical spirit won't produce answers. In Jesus' day, the religious elite, the the Pharisees, commanded that Jesus tell his followers to be quiet. They didn't want to hear them voice their praise, and they were critical for them doing it. They wanted silence, not because something noteworthy hadn't happened, but because they knew that the more the people responded to Jesus, the harder it was going to be to refute his message. And so it is today. For the only way to fight the criticism so rampant in our world is for the church to rise up and be the church. To be positive and praising and prayerful and power-filled as the Holy Spirit enables us to bring peace and a calming, healing presence to the fear that is on our land. We may not be able to defeat the virus, even though with God all things are possible. But we sure can change the attitude that people have if we'll just respond to the criticism with Jesus. We've seen the cult, we've seen the crowd, we've heard the criticism, now let's take a look at the cries. Luke chapter 19, verse 40 says, and Jesus answered and said, I tell you, if these stones become silent, the stones will cry out. Verse 41 says, and when he approached the city, he saw it and he wept, he cried over it. Two different cries that speak incredible truth to all of us. The first cry is a a cry that says, we must respond to all that God has done. It was a cry that the Pharisees didn't want to hear. Luke 19 and 39 says they they didn't want to hear it and they told Jesus to silence it. Their cry was a voice of praise celebrating his miraculous power able to change lives, to transform human existence from spiritual death to spiritual life. They celebrated the fact that Jesus was coming to establish his kingdom. They might not have fully understood everything this moment meant, but it didn't stop them from praising him. And when commanded to tell them to be quiet, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he says that if my followers become silent, the rocks will cry out. Now listen to me. That word is a word not just to the Pharisees, but to us as well. To the Pharisees, he was saying, you can't stop the voice of praise in a move of God. To God's people, he's saying, you'd best voice that praise when you see God 
movie. Now's not the time for the church to be silent. We have so much to be thankful for. God has done so much in in all of our lives. And he continues to keep and to bless and to help and to encourage and to show us light and life, even in difficult times. It's time to praise him, to celebrate his goodness, to see all that he has done and to say in the midst of it, Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. But there's a second cry here that I think we have to pay attention to as well. In verse 41, it says, when he approached, he saw the city and he wept over it. Read those words in your own Bible this morning as we're we're sitting here and just let them sink in for a moment. I've been spending a lot of time lately in the Old Testament seeing the many, many times that God's heart was broken over the sin of his people. But this is one of the places where it is so graphic, where we get to see the humanity of Christ and the brokenness of his spirit. As he approaches, he sees the city and he weeps over it. A number of years ago, Debbie and I had the privilege of coming down that road of descent from the Mount of Olives into the Holy City. There's a point where historians think Jesus may have been when he looked across the city over the the great fortress wall and the eastern gate and he saw the temple, the crowds, the people, the masses. And he realized they had no clue even why they were there. And it broke his heart. They would miss the time of his visitation. The moment when God came and walked among them to give them life. John would write in his prologue in John chapter 1 and verse 11 that that Jesus came to his own. His very own people. But they did not receive him. And when they could have had life and been forgiven of their sins, they turned their back on him. And Jesus wept. And sadly, I think he's still weeping today. He looks across the land filled with people and he wonders, how have they missed seeing me? for all of the God images, for all of the God possibilities, for all of God's grace that flows so richly to those who receive him, there are so many more who reject him. And the price tag of their rejection is significant. I came across some statistics this week that brought me to tears. And I don't want to depreciate any of the lives lost in the first three months of this year to the COVID-19 virus. They are many. And those deaths are significant. But as Jesus looks across the landscape of our world, I want you to consider some of the other deaths that I believe have broken his heart in the first quarter of this year. 
COVID-19 has taken, as of the 1st of April, 46,438 lives. What a terrible picture. But realize as you think of the horror of that, that in that same time frame, 269,076 people have taken their own life. HIV AIDS, the epidemic, has taken 421,808 people in the last three months. Alcohol abuse has brought about 627,571 deaths in three months' time. Smoking-related lung disease has taken 1,252,352 lives in just three months. Hunger. Hunger has taken 2,806,314 lives, most of them children around our world. And the worst of all, abortion in just three months has taken 10,665,130 babies and put them to death before they ever had opportunity to live outside of the womb. In three months, more than 20 are 20 times the number of the deaths that come from the COVID virus. And yet the world hasn't grown to a halt for that. And most people don't even know those numbers exist. And I honestly believe that as Jesus looks over the landscape of our world, he bows his head and he weeps. You see, he knew every single one of those individuals. He knew how they got there. He knew what brought about their fate. He understood the possibilities that were ignored. The choices whose consequences they never imagined. And seeing it all, he weeps. This Palm Sunday and Easter are different. We're not going to celebrate them the same way that we always have. But we will celebrate them. And today we celebrate the coming of a king who showed that greatness is reflected in a servant's heart who cares for the crowds and finds his way through the criticism and responds to the tears of the Savior with a few tears of his own and a commitment to do something to make a difference in the world in which they live. Today we celebrate his coming. Next week we'll celebrate his life. And in the whole of the story, we'll realize that Jesus is watching. This morning as you worship, I'd like to be able to say that I know that each and every one of you knows him. I'd love to be able to say this morning that each and every one of you has a personal relationship with him. But I can't do that. And even though you've seen the story of the 
the cult and the crowd and the criticism and the cries and you've understood what this day is all about, you really don't get it. Because it's just possible you really don't know him. But you can. And this morning, wherever you are, if you are living without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to change that. To open your heart to him. To pray a simple prayer that I'll share in just a moment and to enter into a personal relationship with him that will give you hope and a new life that will allow you to live with the promise of eternity. Today, if you're living without him, I, I just invite you to quietly pray this prayer with me. Because then you can go from the place of being a spectator to being a participant in the greatest story of all. If you want to invite Jesus into your heart today, pray these words with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I've done so many things that are wrong. I need your help, Jesus. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I turn now from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Today, if you have prayed that prayer with sincerity, there's, there's a couple of verses of scripture I want you to see. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it, it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. What those verses tell us is, if you've prayed that prayer, today Jesus has become your Lord. Here at Salina First, we're excited about new life. And today, if you've prayed this prayer for the very first time, uh, we want you to know that we love you and we'd love to send you a Bible and some discipleship materials, some things to help you grow in your relationship. If you're online right now, you can just send a note to Pastor John there as, as he's in the chat room and you can say, today I gave my heart to Jesus and I'd like a, a, to, some help to keep growing. You can just give him your name and your address and we'll get that out to you this week. But if you want to be a little more personal, a little more private, you want to share it in another way, you can just send an email to info at sfnas.com and we'll be glad to communicate with you and share with you the hope of this incredible journey. Palm Sunday came. Palm Sunday went. And in the days that followed, Jesus made a journey to the cross. Amidst all of our loud hosannas and all of our singing, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, may we never forget that he came that day to the holy city to offer his life for us and to give us the hope that could be found only in Jesus. Let's celebrate that. And today, wherever you are, may you know that he has come for you. Pray a word with me. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for the way that you love us and for the way that you loved us there. God, it's so hard to believe that 2,000 years ago when you came into the holy city, the people really didn't have a clue what it was all about. But in a few short days, they would understand. And one week later, they would have the opportunity to respond 
to new life. And just like them, that is what we've done today. For those who have opened their heart to Jesus, we pray your blessings on them and may we be a blessing to them as we help them to grow in their relationship with you. And for the rest of us, may we just celebrate today King Jesus and realize that he's come for us. In the matchless name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We pray you've had a great day in the Lord and just ask that you would uh, celebrate Jesus. Uh, remember the teens have Sunday school here at 11 in about 30 minutes. And uh, Trudy Rathman's Sunday school class uh, starts up at one o'clock. If you're not normally a part of that class, but just want to go to Sunday school, we invite you to ch check that out. It'll be a great day. And then as always, we just remind you that uh, if you'd like to send your tithes and offerings electronically, you can do that right there on the screen, or you can send them uh, to the church through the mail or drop them by the church office. Thanks for your faithfulness. Thanks for being who you are. You are loved. God bless.